Hi, and welcome to this exclusive training video brought to you by Category Management Knowledge Group. We've created this video for you because you're obviously interested in furthering your category management understanding, and you may have already enjoyed some of our other materials that we provide. In this video, I'm going to walk you through five things that you should know in your first five years in retail category management. This video provides you with some snippets of different training that we have available in our many certified training courses. Hopefully you'll get some new ideas and also get excited about investing in you, your team or your organization, and possibly purchasing some of CMKG's training in the future. In case you don't know about Category Management Knowledge Group, let me tell you a few things. I'm Sue Nichols, the president and founder of CMKG. I spent 20 years at P&G, ultimately managing the Canadian Category Management Team, as well as serving on global category management committees. Michelle Patterson is the Director of Training and Development, and also started her career with 12 years at P&G, both in category management, as well as sales, trade marketing, and 10 years as a corporate trainer. The biggest distinction between CMKG and our e-learning competition is that we're category management professionals first, and an e-learning company second. We have a huge passion in what we do and feel privileged to work with so many category management professionals. We offer accredited courses and programs that all relate to category management for individuals, teams, and organizations, including a retailer stream, with many options and flexible ways to create custom blended learning solutions. Our training is applicable to different functions and experience levels in retail and manufacturing organizations, both in North America and globally. So let's get started on the official part of the training. Here's the five tips that we're going to be reviewing. Know your data. Understand planograms beyond a pretty picture. Know how to sell and present. Understand a retailer's income statement. And have a plan and desired outcomes. So the first one is to know your data. We're inundated with new and different data sources. In order to use it and take proper action on it, you need to understand it. For example, how is it sourced? What are the strengths and weaknesses? And how and when should it be used? When you look at all of these data sources, what do they have in common? Scan sales data, retail measurement data, consumer panel data, and shopper loyalty data. Each of them are collected and measured very differently, but they would have one commonality. Can you think of it? They're all reliant on how much the consumer purchases. Ultimately, the consumers drive the data, whether it scans sales data, market data, or consumer panel data. At the end of the day, what ends up in their shopping baskets is what generates the sales for both retailers and suppliers. It's not a difficult concept to understand, but it does help to explain the importance of focusing on the consumer and shopper, even when using data in category management. Each data source has its own watchouts and strengths, which are important to understand. Let's review a few of them. Retail POS data, the queen of category management data, with powerful, flexible analysis. But it doesn't have comparative markets or channels, and retailers need to segment the data ongoing and maintain that segmentation, which many retailers struggle with. Retail measurement data is also very powerful data, with in-depth volumetric and causal analysis and comparative markets and channels for retailers and suppliers to benchmark against but it's sometimes only a sample of stores projected to total chain, and sometimes market doesn't cover a large percent of the total market, particularly in some categories that are involved in alternate channels. Also, the data can be very expensive. Consumer panel data is a great data source to get consumer and shopper information from. It includes consumer demographics, consumer purchase behavior, and even market research. You need to ensure that the data is significant based on the number of raw buyers. You should focus on trends in the data instead of the volumetrics and compare numbers to draw conclusions. Shipment and warehouse data is the data that suppliers ship to retailers' warehouses and the warehouses sent to stores. This is really a last resort data source for situations where you need to create a total market, but you don't have access to any other data. You need to keep in mind that cases sold does not equal consumption because the cases can still be sitting in a warehouse. 
Dollar sales are hard to quantify from cases sold because the cost can vary based on the customer ship to point. And if you're shipping product to one warehouse where it's then shipped to multiple banners, you can't see the allocation across banners. There's much more detail that you should know about your data sources in this, including how each of the sources is gathered. So know your data, not just how it's collected and the strengths and the weaknesses of the data, but think about how it's accessed. Is there limited access to the data and hard to find, or is it easily accessible and consistently available? How difficult is the data mining tool to use? How confident are you with the data that it's pulled correctly out of the tool? And how much usage is there of each of the data sources within your organization, or are you even really using it? Sometimes, how you answer these questions can also correlate with how accurately the data is used for you, your team, and your organization. There's nothing worse than either presenting wrong data to someone or to be receiving incorrect data from someone else. It loses credibility and even worse, it can lead to wrong decisions being made if the errors aren't caught. So you need to know your data and double check it. It's a core requirement whenever data is being used. Because of these errors and issues that can happen with data, it can lead to what I call the data hole pickers for lack of a better term. Those who find the weaknesses in every data source and have everyone so scared to use the data that they don't. And it leaves them with nothing. So understand the watchouts of the data source, ensure you're providing good access to the data for everyone, and start training your organization on understanding the data sources and how they can be maximized. As next steps on knowing your data, first of all, get training on your key data sources. CMKG offers three different courses that relate to data, including our highly popular Understanding and Using Data, and then two that focus specifically on consumer panel data and retailer POS data. You can also bridge any knowledge gaps that you may have in your data understanding by working with your third-party data supplier or through peers in your organization. Lastly, you should identify any gaps that you may have in your data versus what you're expected to do with the data. For example, you can't do promotional effectiveness analysis if you only have monthly data or warehouse data. And you can't do in-depth consumer analysis without consumer panel data. The next tip is to understand planograms beyond them being a pretty picture, because there's so much more than that. Let's review some space management basics. First of all, space management results in the development of planograms. I'm sure all of you have worked with planograms before. They bring retailers and suppliers ideas, analysis, objectives, and strategies to life on store shelves. There's many different types of space management softwares in the industry, from very basic to highly analytic tools. Did you know that there are different types of planograms and that they're intended for different purposes? A display planogram is great for planning how the retailer is going to merchandise those very important display areas in the store and to ensure compliance at store level. An image planogram is meant more for the pretty picture, possibly when selling in a shelving concept versus focusing on the specifics of the planogram. A schematic planogram is meant for the retail store with easy to understand layouts of the planogram for ease of implementation. An analysis planogram is one that has performance metrics mapped out onto it to assess the results. This may include highlighting overstocks and understocks as an example. There's also many different analytic reports available, which should always be reviewed and understood when planograms are developed. So keep in mind the different purposes for creating planograms. It's also important to understand the planogram input requirements. First of all, the retailer's shelf strategies need to be understood. Different retail strategies can affect the shelf layout and the overall targets and objectives for a planogram. This includes their standard fixtures, shopper friendliness, out of stocks, and so on. Next, the retailer's fixture dimensions, including section sizes, gondola measurements, and shelf measurements. These need to be input properly. And lastly, product information needs to be included. Much detail is required at a product level to maximize the use of the planogram software, including product segmentation from the consumer decision tree, unit cost and sales data, live images, and product dimensions. In net, a planogram is only as good as the inputs. Up-to-date and accurate planograms contain detailed records of every product, fixture, and position that's intended to be merchandised in every store. 
I want to emphasize the importance of adding product data into your planograms by adding in unit movement, unit price, and unit cost. This will turn your planogram from a pretty picture into a highly analytic tool. Many different outputs will be available through those basic inputs. Some retail organizations don't use the analytic side of planogramming because of the extra time required to include the data, or the supplier may not provide that to them. But without these inputs, you can't take advantage of the multitude of other capabilities and functionality in the planograms. You're really limiting yourself. Effective planograms that have those data inputs in them have huge synergies with the product supply chain, where many efficiencies can be gained through planogram integration. Some retailers' ordering systems rely on authorized product distribution lists of which products are supposed to be in which stores, plus the shelf capacity data from planograms. The result? Just-in-time orders that are automatically placed accurately without incurring overstocks. Here are some other product supply chain efficiencies that can be incurred by using planograms. Distribution centers can arrange warehouse slots to match the order of products in planograms for more efficient order picking. Pallets can be built in planogram order for more efficient store receiving and stocking. And distribution centers can calculate full loads by determining which products they'll need soon. It's amazing all of the efficiencies that can be gained across the product supply chain based on planograms with accurate inputs. So get to know more about planograms, including the basics about shelving fixtures, basic measures, as well as best practices in space management. CMKG has several courses in these areas. Also, once you start to learn more about the shelf, start looking past the aesthetics or prettiness of a planogram, provide data to include in the planograms, even to your vendor advisors, and request information to vendor partners about changes in inventory, turns, all of the important measures to you when they recommend shelf changes. The next tip is to know how to sell and present. Might be a kind of a surprising one for retailers, but if you're responsible for making internal or external presentations, even as a retailer, you should understand the selling process. It helps to give flow to your presentations when you're selling any kind of idea and trying to get buy-in, regardless of who you're presenting to. Also, by understanding the flow of presentations, as a retailer, you can also get an understanding of where some suppliers' presentations may fall short and really help to identify areas that they need to provide more information on or improve upon when they present to you. A simple flow can be applied to many different types of presentations that you may make. I'm going to walk you through the steps for a good flow. The first step is a summary of the situation, which should consider customers' current conditions, needs, limitations, and or opportunities. These need to tie in with the overall purpose of the presentation. In this case, the customer is someone internal in your organization or a supplier, and a good summary of the situation requires a strong understanding of the customer's overall strategies, as well as short and long-term objectives and the focus areas in their business. A good summary in this situation would be to tie in relevant data that ties in with the overall objectives of the presentation to make it more fact-based. Step two is to state the idea. The purpose of this step is to tell your audience what action you're recommending. The idea is best communicated in one or two sentences, and it should be obvious to the audience before you even state it, if you've done a really good job in setting up the summary of the situation. Step three is explaining how the idea will work. This comprises the main body of the presentation. In this step, you need to connect directly to your purpose and bridge it using relevant points and information. Cover enough points to achieve your purpose and objectives and no more, and be sure to support your points both clearly and concisely. In the fourth step, you should briefly summarize how the idea meets the needs and opportunities that were presented in the summary of the situation. This is also where you explain the specific benefits of your idea where appropriate. This summary should capture the three or four key points of the presentation. The final step is to suggest easy next steps based on specific actions that may tie in with the objectives of the presentation. This is the ultimate purpose of the presentation, yet it's often the most missed step in the process. Whether it's an internal or external pitch, getting the alignment or confirmation is the ultimate goal. Ask for specific actions and you'll make it easy for the action to begin. 
Hopefully you can see from this simple process that it can be applied to many different types of presentations, not just a traditional selling presentation. It really does work. If you don't know how to sell and present, once again, there's many options available to you. There's a lot of great books available on selling and also some great online resources. CMKG has several courses that relate to selling presenting from a retailer's perspective, including a fact-based presentation course, a strategic selling course, and a collaborative selling course, which gets into joint business planning at a higher level between suppliers and retailers. The next tip is to understand a retailer's income statement. If you work for a retailer and you've never seen a retailer's income statement, well, today's your day. Category managers need to be efficient in their roles, thereby building their company's sales, profits, and customers. Part of retail math relates to the key objective measures that are used to evaluate a category manager's efficiencies. These objective measures that they are typically responsible for are broken into three categories, sales, profit margin, and inventory. To get a better understanding of why these measures are not only important to the category manager, but to the retailer, we need to take a deeper look at a retailer's income statement. I've put three key measures for category managers at the top of the slide as a reference that we'll be referring to in just a moment. And here's a basic example of a retailer income statement. All three of these measures that the category manager is responsible for are captured in the retailer's income statement. Sales is the first line of the income statement. Category managers can increase sales through the tactics, including price, promotion, product assortment, and product placement. Next, they can decrease the cost of goods sold, either through affecting profit margin or inventory. And ultimately, by increasing sales and or decreasing the cost of goods sold, the net result is a gross profit for the retailer, both as a dollar amount as well as a gross margin percentage. The gross profit needs to pay for the operating and non-operating expenses and leave a positive net income for the retailer. Obviously, category management is not the only department responsible for the results on the income statement, but for the purposes of this course, we'll be focusing on the areas that they're most accountable for. As I previously mentioned, category managers can affect sales and profit through changes that they implement through the four P's or the tactics. And there are different measures that they should look at within each of those tactics to understand the key drivers of their business. It's easy to sell products fast at low prices and utilizing some of the other tactics, but the balancing act for category managers is ensuring that the products are selling fast and generating acceptable levels of profit for the retailer. If we look back to the second line of the retailer's income statement, it's the cost of goods sold. In general terms, cost of goods sold is the cost of the merchandise that was sold to customers. This figure not only tells the retailer the dollar amount of the cost of the items that have been sold, but it's also subtracted from the net sales to arrive at a gross profit. The lower the cost of goods sold, the higher the gross profit. The retailer can then calculate the portion of each $1 of sales that pays for the cost of the merchandise. So in this example, 74.5 cents of each dollar sold is paid for the cost of goods sold. And the portion of each one dollar of sales that represents profit, also termed as the profit margin or gross margin percent, which in this example is 25.5 percent. Many retailers will develop strategies to reduce their total cost of goods sold, which will ultimately build their gross margins. And many of those strategies tie in to the category manager's responsibilities. Let's understand how. A basic way to calculate cost of goods sold is to start with the beginning inventory for the period and add the total amount of purchases made during the period, then deducting the end inventory. This calculation gives the total amount of inventory, or more specifically, the cost of this inventory sold by the retailer during the period. As an example, if a company starts with $1,500,000 in inventory, makes $500,000 in purchases, and ends the period with $1 million in inventory, the company's cost of goods for the period would be $1 million, or $1.5 plus 500000 minus $1 million. So why is this important for category managers to understand? Well, make note in the calculation the key inputs, the cost of the goods purchased, which directly relates to profit margin, and inventory. 
As we've already covered, these are two of the primary responsibilities of the category management team. In summary, you should understand details about the retailer's income statement and really how you have an influence on it. We have several different courses that relate to these topics, including our Retail Economics in the Product Supply Chain, as well as our Advanced Supply Chain courses. Once again, consider the impact of all the choices that you make and how they impact the overall retail income statement. The last tip is to have a plan and desired outcomes in any big projects or work that you have on your plate. We've all been assigned projects in our professional careers, whether they're project requests from our manager or peers, or even if we're the one assigning the project to someone else. Because you're a retailer, you may also be the person who assigns a project to a vendor advisor or category analyst on the supplier side. What I'm going to show you now is also very relevant if you assign projects to others outside of your organization. Once you've been assigned or once you've assigned the project, of course, the recipient is anxious to do a great job and dives in headfirst to get it done and meet the deadlines. Then they work and work and work. And sometimes this is what happens. So what goes wrong? How did something end up getting created that was completely different than what you or your customer articulated as the project? There may not have been some pre-planning steps prior to jumping in to get the project done. Or if you assign the project to someone else, maybe you didn't think clearly about exactly what you were looking for and ended up disappointed in the end product. In retail, you may have access to great resources through your vendor partners to complete category analysis for you. I'm gonna walk you through a simple process to successfully help you complete your analysis projects and avoid these disappointing situations. First, you need to define the business opportunity or issue. This includes defining the business opportunity for the customer, which may be you as the retailer, the decisions that will be made on the analysis, the objectives and key questions to be addressed, and what success will look like. You should review this with your vendor advisor to make sure that you're both clear on the overall expectations and outputs from the project. As a retailer, the more clear you are with your request and requirements, the more successful the project will be. Next, you need to create a plan instead of determining the plan as you go along. This includes defining the data and tools required, any additional or missing data that's required, who else needs to be involved, the decision makers, and a critical path with all of the key steps and a target deadline date. I'm gonna to refer to the rest of the steps as the responsibility of the analyst, whether it's you as an internal project or the vendor advisor as an external project. The third step is for the analyst to organize and assemble the data. This step can take much longer than expected, particularly if they're sourcing data from different places. Next is the fun stuff, analyzing the data, looking for trends, opportunities, and weaknesses. Of note, unusual findings should not be excluded, and the analyst should not avoid or hide any bad news or important findings that may be concerning. Remember, negatives can be turned into the biggest opportunities. The analyst then summarizes their key findings, ensuring that they tie back to the business issue or opportunity. From this, using the analysis results, experience, and judgment to define the business actions that are called for based on the results. And some recommendations are put together, and once again, they have to tie in with step number one. And finally, review the analysis and action steps with the key decision makers and then have them presented to the customer if they're not the same person or persons. I've added in an eighth step, which is really done after the analysis project is completed. You should summarize the project, including results and follow-up. This is really important so that the history is captured for future projects and opportunities. It could also include a post-evaluation of the entire project, as well as the payouts. So use the analysis process before starting any big projects to ensure that you have a plan and desired outcomes. This includes spending the time to define the opportunities and outcomes required from the projects, which takes up more time up front, but saves a lot of time in the end. We have a more detailed version of the analysis project in our 108 accredited retailer course on understanding and using data. So these are the five tips I walked you through in this exclusive video. I hope you learned a few things, got a few good ideas, and enjoyed the insights that I shared with you. All of the examples that I shared with you come from our set of accredited retailer courses, once again all available online. 
Regardless of if you're looking for industry certification category management, or if you just want to take some great training, our accreditation confirms that our training meets or exceeds industry standards. You can choose to take one course as a quick fix need for a project. You can select a blended group of courses to create a customized program specific for you, or you can take one of our many programs with different available options to you. We've combined courses to create different course groupings based on role and what it is that you're trying to accomplish in your unique retail training program, whether you're trying to get industry certification or if you're looking for a site license approach with access to all the courses. Of note, we can also customize programs for corporate clients to include blended learning and customized elements in the program. Many of our retail clients also take advantage of CMKG's referral program, where you can generate referral fees by recommending the training for your supplier partners and then allocating that back to the cost of your training program. If you're interested in learning more about CMKG courses and programs, here are some suggested next steps. Also, I'm going to be sending you an email from us after downloading this video that will give you more information as well. Once again, I hope you enjoyed the video and I encourage you to continue to venture down your path of continuous learning. Have a great day.